I'm going to talk today about my latest startup, and we're using light to see deep inside our bodies and brains um, and some innovations in consumer electronics. And so what I'm really talking about, what we're doing at Open Water, is replacing this multi-million dollar medical imaging scanner with consumer electronics and putting it into a wearable or a small um, a probe that you can scan over your skin. And you're probably thinking, yeah, sure, right, that sounds impossible. And last night at dinner, people were saying, well, why is this not Theranos? <laughs> it's been in the news a lot. There's a new movie out about the, the company. And um, really, when somebody asks that, they're saying, why is what you're doing not fraud? And so, you know, I actually made a spreadsheet. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, fraud, allegedly. <laughs> Us, not. Um, uh, we both are women with blonde hair. <laughs> we have that in common as founders. But I have a lot of degrees and um, you know, three decades of track record of work of shipping billions of dollars worth of product on the hairy edge of physics. I've got about 250 patents to my name and on and on. And I also have to point out, in terms of audacity, like really a pinprick versus, oh, I can't like have a needle in my arm. OK, that's fine. But we're enabling brain-computer communication and massively reducing the cost of medical imaging, which three quarters of humanity lacks access to. So I think what we're doing is much bolder and much harder. And by the way, a blood prick uh, test just got approved by the FDA last week for Ebola. So it is possible. And we're very open. The reason I'm here today is because we talk every month. We give mon monthly updates about what, it, what we've accomplished and what our challenges are. Just like we did in One Laptop Per Child, as the um, speaker mentioned, I did previously. I co-founded One Laptop Per Child. And every month, we talked about what we were doing to make a $100 laptop. And people laughed at us, said it wouldn't work. And it became the fastest growing consumer electronic category ever recorded and transformed the lives of hundreds of millions of kids in the developing world. So question for the audience. Has anybody ever been inside one of these things? OK, a bunch of people. Good. Not good, I guess. I mean, I learned about it. I was super sick. I did drop out of college once. I, was, I dropped out of my PhD in physics because I was living in a wheelchair, sleeping 20 hours a day, body full of sores. Half of my face couldn't move, so I drooled. And, and then I could no longer remember how to subtract. And so I didn't think I deserved a PhD in physics. And nobody could figure out what was wrong with me. So I finally faced facts and dropped out of school and went home to die. And on the way out, a professor sprung for the cost of an MRI. They found my brain tumor. It took 30 days to have the operation, get better, petition to get back into grad school. I got to use the I had a brain tumor excuse. It worked. <laughs> they let me back in. Um, finished my PhD in six months. Um, and with two other students, we got $4 million to start our first company. So I was off and running. But I never forgot how expensive it was and how it transformed my life. Three quarters of humanity lacks access to medical imaging. Three quarters. These systems in 1995, the one that saved my life, cost millions of dollars. Each scan is thousands of dollars. And yet, it's how we do early detection of cancer and many other diseases. It's too expensive. It's not getting cheaper, you know, 1% better every year. It's time, I thought, to do something about it. And there's, there's another thing about medical imaging. It actually causes cancer. If you're too big to fit in the MRI machine, you get a CT. If you have, as a child, a number of CTs, your chance of leukemia or brain cancer triples. But for the overall population as adults, you, 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 medical imaging causes 3 to 5% of cancers. And so it's, you, you know, that's a double-edged sword. So how our system works, we, um, one thing, uh, magnetic resonance imaging doesn't have x-rays or gamma rays. Those are the things causing cancer. So MRI is super expensive. But um, here I, I've got a smartphone here. Oh, Google's trying to help me. Um, so here's a flashlight. And if I put my finger in front of the flashlight, you can see the red light goes right through my finger. So do gamma rays, so do x-rays, so do two-ton magnets. But, but guess which one is cheaper? Like, by a lot. So the issue is actually the light gets scattered. And I noticed some improvements in consumer electronics that I thought could enable us to descatter the light going through our bodies. So I left um, 
my job um, in consumer electronics at Facebook a few years ago to explore this. And using holography and ultrasonic pings, um, we've basically designed a system to do this using new kinds of camera chips we've developed, new kinds of ultrasonic chips, and um, a new kind of laser. And so how does that work? We send, for example, if these black dots represent uh, the elements, the new chips that we've made, we send a ping down, an ultrasonic ping into the brain. Where the ping focuses, we bring in red light. Remember, it scatters everywhere. But the light that goes through that ping changes color ever so slightly. We bring in another beam under a neighboring chip, and we interfere those two beams. It's called holography, like an old school definition of holography, the thing that won the Nobel Prize in the early 70s. And there we create this interference. And you see those fringes. And we can record those fringes only now because pixel sizes and camera chips have gotten really small. And that's been really enabling. So we can see the light that just came from that spot and not the other light because it changes color when it goes through an ultrasound ping just like the pitch of a police car siren changes as it speeds past you. It's called Doppler shift. So we use that and we decode that image, much like Rosalind Franklin decoded this iconic image of X-ray diffraction to reveal the structure of DNA for the first time. It took her a while. She didn't really get full credit. But um, we can now do that a million times a second in the chips that we've designed. So why this, why now? This is really possible now thanks to the tens of billions of dollars that have been invested for manufacturing process improvements in the silicon supply chain of the world, the trillion dollar consumer electronic supply chain to enable basically next generation Pokemon Go. I'm not joking, <laughs> I wish I was. Um, but getting those pixel sizes down really fine and getting the sensors of the environment down are important because that Pokemon figure has to be right on this desk, not in one inch below one and when I touch it. And then also we want high fidelity um, screens in front of our eyes in VR. And so we've been able to use that to make these systems. So it really is classic innovator's dilemma. Two ton magnets, there's no manufacturing process improvements on two-ton magnets coming, but using what the tools of our time, which includes the silicon factories of the world and the consumer electronics supply chain, I believe we can leapfrog where we are. So this was our system last year. It looks kind of big and bulky. It took up a whole room. But we used existing off-the-shelf components so we could finalize our architectures of our chips and so forth and prove to ourselves we could get good images. And now, this is our system um, right now. And uh, we've made new chips, a new camera chip, a new ultrasonic chip, a new kind of laser that pulses. And this is a two by two foot little rig. It's a smaller system. We'll reduce that again further to the size of, of that kind of a probe or even a mobile phone. But right now, this allows us to change the system and architect it in a way that we can get the best image quality. So. With that, last year, these were the kinds of images that we could um, scan with phantom optically mimicking and ultrasonically mimicking um, um, tissue. We could find the tumor or the vasculature right there. And then um, we started to scan rats. We have a small animal imaging facility. Um, no rats were harmed. Um, and we started to scan rats. And we noticed the images were kind of noisy. So we took a step back and spent the last few months looking at the noise in our system. And we've been able to improve the signal to noise ratio by eightfold. And the signal intensity, our laser wasn't always the same power going out, um, uh, by 23-fold. And we keep going. Like That's a huge amount of improvement in two months of looking at it. So we, what we're doing right now is taking homogeneous slabs of fat or muscle and scanning them so a perfect image is absolutely nothing. So now, as we finish that, we're going to um, scan rats again, and we'll be publishing those images soon. But really, the, step, the major step for this, when you think about a drug and the risks for a drug, it's at stage three. There's an Alzheimer drug that failed last week. The big risk, the white hot risk for us, is right now it's image quality, and that's where we're spending our time and effort. And it's basically the integration of these components with image quality, AI machine learning, our systems, and our our subcomponents, but we'll have alpha kits this year. In fact, we kind of already do have an alpha kit. We're just not releasing it because we're, you know, developing the image quality. 
So with that, we can combine the best of MRI, the best of infrared, and the best of ultrasonic imaging to allow us to see inside of our bodies and more. Um, there's more capabilities that we can offer as well. But the implications of this are pretty profound. It's access to medical imaging for everybody. And then the decoding of the medical images using AI machine learning and the great radiologists that there are not enough of if you think of the three quarters of humanity that doesn't have access to them. So this can go in an ambulance to detect, say, for example, what kind of stroke you had, which is a key thing. It's the leading cause of disability in the US, whether you have a clot type stroke or a hemorrhagic type stroke. There's a pill that you can take that can burst the clot or clot, but if you get the pill wrong, the patient dies. And today that means access to a CT scanner within three hours of a stroke. Tomorrow it can be in every ambulance, doctor's office, pharmacy, and pr protect that. Also, when you're having surgery, did you get it all out? We can find out quickly. Or at home, if you have a tumor, is the therapy working? There's also a lot we can do for brain disease and brain communi computer communication that I'll talk about. But when you think of this in a limit, you can do a scan for a buck instead of a thousand, for a dollar instead of a thousand dollars. It really changes how much data you get. If you're not feeling well, you can scan yourself and you really ultimately don't care about false positives. You just track it. Like when you're taking your temperature and you have a fever, if it gets over a certain state, go to the hospital. Otherwise, you know, you basically care about the answer to, is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Is it staying the same size? And if it's getting bigger, that tends to be the concern. If it's getting smaller, that's probably good. So with this, I think we'll have very quickly more medical imaging data than everybody else combined. And so we should be able to learn as we work with all these groups more about disease and, and their cures. I mentioned there's some more capabilities. We can also, since we're focusing the ultrasound for a microsecond, a little ping, if we focus it for a million times longer, we can ablate tissue. We can do surgery without the knife, without an, an incision, without the risk of infection. We're, we're collaborating with the Focused Ultrasound Foundation, who's been a real pioneer in this area. These are now FDA approved. We can also open the blood-brain barrier, do local delivery of drugs, and even do neuromodulation, like as is approved for Parkinson's disease and essential tremor with this system. And there's, there's more than that. The most expensive healthcare system in the world is that for brain disease. And there's a biological basis. You usually answer some questions to see if you're clinically depressed. One of, it, one of those questions is, do you have thoughts of suicide? And anyway, um, if you're clinically depressed, there's actually a pattern in your head. Right now, one of these scans, an fMRI, costs $20,000. But with the 1,200 samples that a group of hospitals put together last summer, they found that there were patterns for anhedonia kind of clinical depression as opposed to anxiety clinical depression in others. And then you could see if the pill that you were taking or the therapy you were taking was working or not. It's no longer subjective, but objective. So we could really change mental health care. And then there's communicating with thought alone. This is work by one of my favorite professors, Jack Allen at UC Berkeley, where he put graduate students in MRI machines for hundreds of hours showing them YouTube videos while the computer made recordings of their brains reacting to the image sequences. Then he showed a new presented clip, and the computer inferred with the data it had what it thought the student was looking at, which is pretty grainy. I saw This is about a decade old now. I saw this, and I'm like, whoa, all we have to do is up the resolution and shrink down the size of the imager, and there you go. Um, and, and if you combine with that the, the fact that when you imagine an image versus uh, looking at an image, the same areas light up in your head. So a Japanese group has now done this with dreams. And so the bet is with massively more data, higher resolution, and um, adding, we can actually focus down to a neuron, and combining with the work being done by the brain initiatives all over the world, getting some hierarchical data, we can get even further. Just to be clear, this is correlation. We're not understanding how the neurons are connecting. We're just looking at the use of oxygen. Just looking at oxygen use, you can do this. So essentially, what we're doing at Open Water, we think is inevitable. Using near-infrared light, the tools of our time, machine learning, AI, and advances in consumer electronics, it's going to happen. People are dying. Join us and come together to make it happen. Thank you.